So welcome back to our series on software testing. In this last episode, we're gonna be covering smoke testing and load testing. So stick with us. Let me explain. Here it goes. A is for ambition. B, what I want to be. C, past the situation that's in front of me. Doubt is an enemy. We say Smoke testing. Now, I'm not keen on the name, but what it means is, yeah. is you deploy a new version of your software, and then you run a quick set of tests in it. Mm -hmm. A smoke, a flash, I guess. I don't know where the name comes from. I think but, it's, it's about looking for where there's smoke, there's fire, I think is uh, the, the analogy they're playing on there. Well, anyway, you run this quick suite of tests um, just to make sure all the basic functionality of your system is still working after redeployment. Um, obviously, you can't pick long-running tests for a smoke test, can you? What, what tests should you look to include in a smoke test? Don't break the till. Never break the till. And I know that sounds like a really, really simple argument, but never, never break the till, never break your homepage. Um, smoke tests are fascinating, actually, because they're super, super useful. I remember working at a very, very large e-commerce um, startup, uh, household name, and we had a very, very simple way of making sure we didn't break the till. Every five minutes, we bought something from ourselves with a real credit card. And it sounds really, really trite, but that thing gave us first warning on anything breaking. And it was just scripted. We would buy like a two pound product from ourselves with a special credit card. We put a couple of thousand pounds on a month and it moved from one company bank account to the other company bank account. And it probably cost us in payment transaction fees, a couple of hundred pounds in total to have this thing running continuously. But we knew with absolute safety that those smoke tests were running a hundred percent of the time. And they would go red probably before anyone would call our help desk. And, and you know, I, I can't think of a better use of money. It's cheaper than hiring staff to click things. <laughs> it's, it, it pays for itself. Um, the, the other kind of interesting thing. It's a thing bit like automating a human user to be 24-7 clicking away on our website. Exactly that. Problems. Exactly that. And um, the other interesting side effects of smoke tests is they do test out of bound downstream dependencies. So the nice thing about that test specifically is it was testing our payment provider. And in, I won't name any of the entities involved in this. At the time, the payment provider we were using was optimized for physical UK shop sales. That was what their payment backbone was designed for. We took the physical limitations off that by presenting this stuff on the web. And I think on one of the especially busy periods, we're talking 20,000 concurrent users a second kind of busy. Um, what they found was they just had never scaled their hardware and their data centers to support that amount of concurrency. And it was an interesting relationship and they worked with us and we throttled back and they helped us. But actually those kinds of early warnings really, really saved us because we could actually turn off and throttle back at our end rather than pummeling our downstream dependencies into the ground. So by running this continuous smoke test, you were able to see when the system broke down under load. And that actually leads me on to realize that we've got another important type of test, which is doing some kind of stress or load test. Now that is when you usually have an online system or a server-based system and lots of users can log on and you are testing to see what happens when you, know, you increase those number of users to a point that it puts stress on your whole system. I guess load testing comes in at a couple of different points in the development life cycle, actually. So there are, there are well-worn tools like Gatling and I forget the name of the Java, the Java one, artillery, Gatling, there's all sorts of tools available uh, that you can use to simulate traffic on your local machines and pummel web applications. So yeah. that'll, get, that'll get you so far. And that's good enough for most small sites generally good enough uh, and the reason I say that is because normally you will run out of bandwidth on your network card generating traffic punishing your software before your software will break modern web frameworks are pretty resilient so Gatling Set is with the idea that you're just shooting so many bullets at something you're bound to hit a problem uh, yeah yeah that, that exactly exactly so what it does is it simulates uh, request journeys of, of users and you can generate these requests from capturing real user journeys or you can write them by hand and broadly all of the various load testing suites pretty much work the same way um, 
it's all well and good, and you can find an amount of bugs in your system. Like, if you try to use load test to find bugs, you will find them. You'll find places where you have performance contention in your software. The sad, horrible, brutal truth about that is you will still go live, and load will still get you. And it's because while you may have profiled a certain amount of hot paths through your system, actually, the thing that you might be missing is maybe one hot path, while there's some ambient traffic on some other areas of the site, maybe produces particular pressures on your database and breaks your software in funny ways. There's a lot of things that maybe you can't really anticipate with load tests, and truly, real life is the biggest load test. I mean, we see lots of, you know, Russian cyber attacks, denial of service, and mm -hmm. obviously there's a level of load that just about everybody's system is going to break down. But yeah. I guess about testing, make sure your system can handle, you know, a reasonable amount of load, as much load as you expect during the Christmas period, or as much load as you can, you know, handle. In a reasonable so one of the really, one of the really clever things that I've been involved in doing before with, again, very, very big consumer facing sites is replicating traffic. So we would put from our load balancers that serve regular production, we would mirror the traffic onto a second piece of infrastructure and it would be almost production like. So it wouldn't send card payment information, it wouldn't process transactions against third parties. So it wasn't perfectly like for like, but actually, it was a really, really good way to trial new internal versions of the software and sucker punch it with real traffic. It obviously is predicated on the fact that you have enough ambient passive traffic to be able to have some data to replicate, but you can always scale it up and, and do some maths on that. About load testing is that you see thing, you can, you can ship pre-release versions of software into load test environments with replicated traffic from production. And actually, it's not so much about the quality of your load tests, it's about testing the quality of your instrumentation because none of this stuff happens in isolation. Um, and the, the, the thing about performance and I suppose DevOps in production systems is just as much of it is about monitoring and signals intelligence and alerting as it is about upfront testing and load generation. So you're kind of saying that a lot of the problems that you wouldn't otherwise see in your code suddenly become clear because of the performance and strain you're putting them under. Exactly that. And, and you know what, like our tooling is very, very good in dev these days. So if you're in the Microsoft space, this performance profile is built into Visual Studio. JetBrains have similar tools in their IntelliJ suite and family of um, IDEs where you can, in your local dev environments, you can see the performance and the hot paths through specific pieces of code. The, the truth is stuff will always get you. There's always going to be stuff that gets you in production. So how you gracefully degrade your systems is then how, how, uh, how you're measured, really. Can you scale out? Can you redirect people? Can you put Cloudflare in between to buffer some of the traffic? All of those kinds of performance engineering things are really, really valuable. And I think that's where the original... Google site reliability engineering ethos came from. That's where they wrote the, I don't know whether it was a book or an essay really, where they wrote the original document, document, whatever it was, I don't think it's a book, um, for, for SREs. And it's all about making sure that web apps stay up and are operable and are monitorable rather than just simulating some load and shipping some containers. And I think that's quite interesting really when you, when you really dig into it. I think the other, um, there's actually a kind of testing that we've, we've missed on top of this when we're thinking about load and it almost harks back to my story about the payment providers, downstream dependencies are terrifying because in, in the modern web, the number of downstream services that your software depends on for the smallest things well, that meant, really. What, would, what is a downstream dependency? Of course. So imagine you have an e-commerce website and you want to offer currency conversion. So you, you only ever transact in your local currency. Say you're in Australia and you only really take payments in Australian dollars. But conversion rates prove that if you don't show people the price of something in their local currency, the odds of them buying it are very, very slim because they have to do head maths and nobody likes doing maths. So what people tend to do is they'll use a currency conversion API maybe from their from their web app. And every time a user lands on one of your product pages, 
it'll go up to the currency conversion API and it'll quickly translate your price into whatever the current exchange rate dictates their price to be. And it will write approximately and it'll put that on the page. Now it sounds completely safe and sane, except you just introduced dependency. So if you all of a sudden get a huge amount of traffic, you really have to know what the performance characteristics of all those downstream dependencies are because they could block your software and crash it. They could be pushed offline by you sending too many requests. And actually in this distributed computing as default world, you have to be prepared to cache and buffer and protect your downstream dependencies just as much. So when you're load testing things, actually there's a lot of different kinds of failure patterns that you might see. Um, I tend to do a couple of things to mitigate against this. So one of them is always to make sure you're caching downstream dependencies. Like all, you need to make sure you don't sucker punch anyone else off the internet. Like it, both it's not good form and also your software will crash if you do it. So it's not, nobody wins. And on, on top of that, I often introduce an extra set of tests, which um, I think Martin Fowler calls them consumer driven contracts. And the idea is that when you have a downstream dependency that you consume a port, some service from, you are bound to some contract, some programming API or some document they present and make available. Now, you can't control what they release. You can't control when they change their performance characteristics and you can't, change, you can't control when they change their API. What you do have control over is you know exactly how much of their service and exactly what bit of data that you consume from them. So to, to take that currency conversion API as an example, say that I sell things only in Australian dollars and I want the British pound price for something that I call. Maybe at some point in the future, they're going to rename the value that comes back when I send an API request to them from British pound to great British pound. If they do that, my software might break. And the first time that I would know that happened is when it happens. So much like your smoke test check that your system is on, you don't break the till that your homepage is still running. You can write consumer driven contracts to just in production, send fake requests at all your downstream dependencies on a schedule, maybe one a minute, maybe one every five minutes. So this is automatically then, testing other people's system. Exactly. Exactly. They that. send you the kind of data that you were expecting and they don't suddenly change. Ex exactly that. So, uh, but the, the specific nuance to it is you're not checking that they have not released a new version of the software. I don't care if 10 new countries got invented and they put their new names for them in their API response. I don't care about that. I just care that they haven't changed the name British pound because that portion of the contract, that portion of the response is what my software depends on. And the great thing about it is it makes you really, really resilient to versioning changes of, of downstream APIs Definitely. because they can change their entire response as long as there's still something in there that says British pound, 10 pounds to two decimal places, then my system still works and my tests prove that that's the case. Um, so often I find it quite valuable to take these consumer driven contracts and both plumb them into their product, so downstream dependencies, production systems, and also if available, their testing systems, because it kind of protects you from that situation where vendors change something subtle and they don't realize they've made those mistakes, but ultimately it's your customers that are going to, lose their heads if your system crashes. They're not going to go and shout at your vendor. So protecting yourself from all these combinatorial downstream effects of tests that fail is really important. 